I'm going to give you a quick tour through the world of biologic therapy in IBD. And I'll start with a confession. I mean, we really don't understand the pathogenesis of IBD. Um, it's very fashionable to say that it's multifactorial, that it's an environmental gene interaction. But, you know, when I was a young assistant professor, I used to teach medical students about peptic ulcer disease. And that's what I told them at the time. And I was absolutely wrong. So I think we have to keep an open mind about this whole issue of the cause of the disease. And, you know, again, full confessional, if you don't know the cause, it's hard to design treatments. So our treatment is empiric and anti-inflammatory. And here we see uh, what I see in the endoscopy room. You can see on the left-hand panel, active inflammation with ulcerative colitis. Normally, the uh, bowel, and only gastroenterologists would like this. I mean, the lining of the bowel looks like your conjunctiva. It's shiny, gleaming, beautiful. And there you see ulceration, confluent ulceration. And then on the right-hand panel, um, uh, histopathology 101, blue is bad. There's lots of blue there, and um, it's infiltration of neutrophils in the crypts of the colon um, due to an unknown provoking factor. So here's the traditional etiopathogenesis slide. So I'm going to talk uh, initially about TNF blockers, and that really has transformed the therapy of IBD just as it has in the other diseases you've talked about in the last couple of days. And this story goes back a long time. And so this picture is from New York City around the turn of the century, and this is William B. Coley. He was a head and neck surgeon, and uh, you can see he's at the head of the operating room table there. And he's injecting the lymph node of a patient with advanced head and neck cancer with streptococcal antigen, fever therapy. And in retrospect, we can recognize that perhaps he was uh, developing endogenous cytokine therapy, uh, perhaps TNF at the time. There was good pathology in New York City at the turn of the century, and people have gone back and retrospectively looked at these cases and have documented tumor regression with this approach. Uh, times have changed, however. You can see the nurses there. Uh, modern nurses don't quite look like that with the little hats. And most remarkably, the medical students you can see in the background. I don't see any newspapers. They're not texting each other. They're not on <laughs> Tinder or whatever, you know. So times have changed. And why has this been such a success? Well. It's because TNF is such a pleiotropic molecule. It affects many pathways. We still really don't understand how it works, quite frankly, in 2015. But it has a lot of effects. And I can old, I'm old enough to remember being in drug development meetings in the early 90s where people swore that this would not work because it was monotonic. It was affecting one pathway. And these diseases are complex. They have multiple pathways. And we've been through the PATH inhibitors and the prostaglandin analogs and they proved to fail. Well, I'm delighted to say in 2015 that those people were absolutely wrong. And it started with rheumatologists, God forbid. Um, you, these folks, Maney and Feldman, and the infamous picture here, uh, the micrograph showing macrophages and panis chock full of TNF, and taking a, a, from dermatology, if it's wet, dry it. If it's dry, wet it. Block TNF and see what happens. Um, and the rest is, was, was history. And, for once, I think gastroenterologists were at the table. And this fellow, the handsome fellow, is uh, Sonder van der Venter. And Sonder uh, was really very interested in the biology of TNF. Uh, he his career is really interesting. He started out as an intensivist and then was drawn into gastroenterology indirectly. He was involved in the sepsis studies of TNF blockers, and that didn't work out so well. We now know that it's a bad idea to give TNF blockers to patients with sepsis. But in the aftermath of that, um, Sonder had some drug left from those trials. And you can imagine the courage he had to have to administer a colleague's 14-year-old daughter with Crohn's disease, um, CA2, which ultimately became Remicade, and reported this in The Lancet in 2003. Patient was treated in 2002 and first patient treated. And unlike a lot of Lancet case reports, this one turned out to be real. Uh, that ultimately became to be a very effective drug. I think Saunders still remains an inspiration to me. Um, you know, he became a full-blooded gastroenterologist, did ERCP, the whole thing, and then morphed into the ultimate career change. He's now an investment banker and uh, heads up the largest European bio, uh, biologic uh, venture capital fund. So there's a lesson there for you all. <laughs> um, you know, as someone who's involved in clinical trials, this was the cover of Gastroenterology, and I looked at it and I said, oh my god. Because this is the N of six experience. They obviously took their best picture. You can see horrible looking linear Crohn's disease on the left hand panel, 
One shot of CA2 come Remicade, and we've got cure. And I, I recognize that uh, gastroenterologists didn't need randomized controlled trials um, after that picture. We did do randomized controlled trials, and ultimately, these drugs were very effective. So we now treat patients with infliximab, sertolizumab, adalimumab, just like rheumatologists and dermatologists, and with good results. But there's room for improvement. And I, I think TNF blockers are great drugs, but if you look, sadly enough, at the net remission rates at six months, they're not 70 or 80 percent like our dermatologists. It's, it's more like 25 or 30 percent. And if you include steroid free remission, it's even worse than that. So we really need to have better options. And we've, um, one, of the, one of the themes I've heard today is optimization. And we've really learned how to optimize TNF blockers. And this is a trial I was privileged to be involved with uh, called Step, uh, Step Up, Top Down. And it involved, it really was an algorithm study <coughs> looking at early therapy with early introduction of combination therapy with azathioprine or methotrexate plus infliximab versus a sequential step care approach, which is familiar to rheumatologists. And what that trial showed was that, in fact, if we started early in newly diagnosed patients, that early combination therapy beat um, step up conventional approach. However, that's not a message that really has been very friendly uh, or well received in the, in the gastroenterology community because of concerns about toxicity. And um, despite the fact that we have increasing evidence that combination therapy is more effective for the reasons that I heard just a few minutes ago, that actually whether you combine azathioprine or methotrexate with a TNF blocker, you prevent immunogenicity and you raise drug levels through nonspecific effects on drug clearance. And this is our uh, landmark study. This would be like premier in the rule of rheumatology or tract. Uh, it's combination therapy study called Cotonic which looks at, you can see, combination therapy with infliximab and uh, azathioprine versus monotherapy with either drug, and clearly the combination therapy is more effective over a six-month period and with um, no increased risk of side effects. Now, we recently had the opportunity to take this to the community because a lot of our naysayers said, well, that's great at academic centers, you can do combination therapy study like Sonic, but in the real world where real men and women practice, those academic studies really aren't relevant. We know that these drugs are toxic. They, they are associated with combination therapy. I, hey, I went to medical school. Um, if one drug causes bad side effects and you add a second drug, one plus one has to equal two. Well, we did the study called REACT, and it's the largest study. It's coming out in Lancet in a few weeks. The largest study of combination therapy and community algorithm, it's early combined immunosuppression versus step care in the community. And what we showed that the early introduction of combination therapy was more effective for preventing complications of the disease, uh, surgery, serious complications, hospitalization, and any bad thing as shown in these Kaplan-Meier curves. And the punchline is that interestingly enough that the rate of serious infections and mortality, because we had 2,000 patients in the study, we could actually measure mortality as an endpoint, was not increased. There was no increased risk. Well, how can that be? Well, think of a, your patient with immune disease who gets infected. What do they look like? Well, they have active disease, they're debilitated, and they get steroids. Those are all risk factors for infection. So if you drive more patients into remission with a more effective therapy, you have fewer events. So one plus one probably does equal two, but there's a missing part of the equation, minus one, so you're back to neutral. And that's been a really interesting um, event. And we also have data from other studies that show that in fact early introduction of TNF blockers and combine therapy prevents surgery and hospitalization. Now, Lenny alluded to um, the issue of immunogenicity and therapeutic drug monitoring. And I think I spent my whole career apologizing for being a gastroenterologist. And it usually starts out, oh, we're 10 years behind the rheumatologist, like we're not worthy, <laughs> that sort of deal. Um, I'm delighted to say for the first time, I think it's the first time I said this in public, is that we're now five years ahead of the rheumatologist in terms of therapeutic drug monitor. And when I hear yesterday, I heard a, a transcript of yesterday's conversation is, well, you know, therapeutic mon mon drug monitors for losers like gastroenterologists, we don't need that. You guys are absolutely wrong, okay, and I'll, I'll explain this to you. So we got into recognizing the value of therapeutic drug monitoring and, and the problem of immunogenicity early because we weren't very smart. Um, we started giving TNF blockers intermittently without concomitant immunosuppression. 
But we learned quickly. Within a year, we recognized that was a complete disaster. And if you do that, and I think dermatologists might be sort of closet liking to do that too. Um, you know, that's not the way to give foreign proteins. It's, it's a recipe to immunize. And this was the first study by Barrett and colleagues way back in 2003 that really demonstrated the issue of anti-drug uh, anti antibodies and the relationship to not only side effects, but more importantly, loss of efficacy. More recently, we've, I think, unlocked a really important dirty little secret about monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are very good drugs because they're highly selective. They don't have the off-target side effects that small molecules do. But they have something else that we weren't aware about. They have more variability in drug clearance than small molecules. And so if you're using a standard dose off-the-rack monoclonal and you're putting in a patient, don't assume that they're going to have the average drug level. And this study, this, I could show you 10 studies that show this, that there is a relationship, and we only have associations yet, between drug exposure, not drug dose, and efficacy. Now the real question is, if you take patients in the lowest quartile of exposure and pull them to the top of the quartile exposure, will you get greater efficacy? And that question has not been answered, but it's a question that's being asked right now in the world of gastroenterology. And we recognize this in, in a very common clinical context, and God forbid that any of you folks look after patients with severe ulcerative colitis. These people are really problematic. The go-to drug is infliximab, and we put in five mg per kg of infliximab. Normally, two days later, you would expect to see five, 50 to 70 micrograms per mil in, in the serum. Some of these people will have no drug in a monoclonal that has a half-life of 12 days within 24 to 48 hours. They're just catabolizing the drug. They're dumping it into, this, into, this, into the lumen of the gut. Uh, they're clearing it very fast through the reticular endothelial system. And you know what? There are patients with rheumatoid arthritis that have similar problems. So just a word to the wise. So we've evolved into this model of therapeutic drug monitoring. If we have patients with a secondary loss of response, and some of this information co actually comes from rheumatology, that we measure trough drug levels, and if they're antibody negative and they're below a target serum threshold, then we increase the drug. That's simple to think about. They need more drug. Well, if they're antibody positive and they don't have drug, well, uh, they're sensitized. But they responded to that class. So you can go back to the well and give another TNF blocker with about an 80 percent experience of, uh, of success. And that was shown in the famous JAMA paper in, in RA. Well, if you're antibody negative and you um, have an adequate drug, then again, you're probably good to switch out of class. And rheumatologists are blessed. You have a lot of out-of-class drugs. And then finally, with the new assays, we can now detect antibody in the presence of drug. And we have some data for this suggests that's a bad thing, too. But that's really an unknown area yet. We need more information about that class of patients. OK. So and then finally, I'll just finish off the comments about TNF blockers and just say the biggest problem with TNF blockers is infection. And we recognize a serious infection. And these are common infections. It's not, it's not tuberculosis. Or if you watch TV, it's not you've been to the San Joaquin Valley and call your physician. Uh, it's lobar pneumonia, primary influenza pneumonia. And in Crohn's disease, failure to clear the pelvis with, uh, with an MR or an examination under anesthesia, pelvic abscess, that's a bad situation. So these are preventable things, but TNF blockers, this is a limitation. And I'm delighted to talk about a drug that um, no one's mentioned yet in this uh, area, and it relates to leukocyte trafficking. And we've heard about the molecular events that govern that. It was worked out 30 years ago. And it's amazing how these, the amount of force that these lymphocytes are under, the shear force is equivalent to the, the famous fountain in Lake Geneva. So to get those lymphocytes to stick to the blood vessels, you have to have very powerful interactions to get them out of the shear stream. Um, I've already shown you the blue is bad slide. So once white blood cells get into tissues, they do bad things. And that that is governed by molecular mechanisms that are exquisitely sensitive. And in the gut, the gut is a special place. The primary um, specific trafficking of lymphocytes into the gut is governed by alpha-4, beta-7, MADCAM interactions. So these are heterodimers, the, uh, the proteins on the surface of the white blood cells. 
and they come in various flavors. Alpha-4, beta-7 interacts with MADCAM. Alpha-4, beta-1 um, interacts with VCAM, which is on every vascular bed in the body. So I'm sure that uh, anti-alpha-4 would work very nicely for rheumatoid arthritis as a, as a treatment. Unfortunately, um, blocking alpha-4 has turned out to be pro problem, and we've heard about natalizumab, and I'm not going to go all the problems. I thought the talk on MS was just great. Uh, it illustrates that natalizumab is a highly effective drug, but it has its downside. We treat patients with Crohn's disease. We did large trials. It was a great drug to treat Crohn's disease, and I'm using the past tense because it's no longer used uh, because of the problems that were outlined with progressive multifocal leukencephalopathy. And for gastroenterologists, uh, we don't know very much about neurology, but when neurologists start using long words, it's very bad. It's, it's uniformly bad. And it, this really killed the drug in multiple scro in use of Crohn's disease. Fortunately, there's a happy side to this, is that a more selective approach was used and directly targeting alpha-4, beta-7 as opposed to alpha-4, um, beta-1. A colleague of mine many years ago in Boston uh, worked in a lab where they had one trick pony. They would uh, sensitize lymphocytes, well, they would activate lymphocytes with poquid mitogen, and then they would raise antibodies to the lymphocyte activation antigens, thinking that they, these proteins must be important in immune responses. So a colleague of mine, Andy Lazarevitz, Andy was a nephrologist, uh, tragically died of glioma back a few years ago, and Andy raised a, a murine antibody called ACT1, and it interacted with alpha-4, beta-7. Andy never found the ligand for alpha-4, beta-7. Hesterberg and Podolsky in Boston, um, about 15 years ago, identified it. It was MADCAM. Put it into the Tamaran model, and Tamaran shown here. These are New World monkeys. Um, so they, they grow up in the rainforest of Peru and Ecuador. They get what looks like human ulcerative colitis, not in the wild, but when they're in captivity in Quito, in the zoo. The zookeeper described it first. Um, and so if you believe in the psychological theory of IBD, this is probably your best model. Uh, there were breeding colonies in, in, at the NIH and in Liverpool. Uh, the disease has now died out because of uh, probably animal husbandry legislation. You can't be nasty to the monkeys. Or, so they've lost their ulcerative colitis. But we took this antibody, humanized it, um, again, put it into, uh, this is a phase two trial, showed that it was effective in ulcerative colitis. And that ultimately went into a phase three trial, which was reported uh, just a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And also applied a dramatic effect on remission, response, mucosal healing, both in induction and in maintenance. We also evaluated in Crohn's disease, less uh, viable the drug in Crohn's disease, seems to be slower working, um, and, but highly effective in maintenance therapy. So something different about ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease with regard to this molecule. But a very exciting drug. It was just approved a year ago, and it's been widely used uh, for the treatment of IBD. And of course, the, the huge advantage potentially of this is that because it's gut selective, you shouldn't have the infectious problems that you see with TNF blockers. Now, we've shown that in the trials. We've only exposed 3,000 patients for up to six years. Ultimately, the proof will be in large-scale registries and safety studies. So this is now a validated approach, and there are other ways of skinning the cat here. You can also block beta-7. You could block MADCAM directly, um, and there are trials going on. This was just a study we published in Lancet back last year showing that an antibody, humanized antibody to beta-7, etrolizumab, is effective for treating acute colitis. And um, again, there's a lot of commonalities in disease. Uh, neurologists and IBD doctors get together, uh, not with TNF blockers, but with the S1P1s. And we heard about fengolimod as a treatment. This is a trial in New England back a few years, comparing it to beta interferon for uh, preventing um, relapse in, in, in MS and showing it's effective. And we just recently have now trialed this drug, uh, a cousin of this drug, in uh, actually all sort of colitis, and showing a nice dose-response relationship for remission and response in that disease. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about TH17 pathway. Uh, we've also dabbled with that as well, and uh, we've done phase two studies. Ustekinumab probably is effective in Crohn's disease, and we've uh, completed two phase two studies, and there's an ongoing phase three program which will be completed, and the results will be available just in a few months. So I suspect we'll have another out-of-class drug. We're still four or five behind the rheumatologist, but we're, we're getting there. 
and um, in fact that this uh, potentially is a safer approach than TNF blockers. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through this and go to the conclusions. Um, we've become facile in the use of biologic therapies over a period of 20 years. The TNF antagonists have really revolutionized therapy for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and it was miserable to practice in the area before we had biologic therapy. We've got anti-adhesion molecules, and we had an initial good and bad experience with Tisabri. Uh, we now have vetalizumab uh, as the first viable out-of-class drug, and ustekinumab and other agents such as the S1P1 agonists are likely to come on the therapy. I'd like to just close with a thought, though, that we've now got this cacophony of therapies converging on us. And in order to work them out, we're going to have to do real-world algorithm studies like the study I showed you with TNF blockers. And as someone involved in clinical trials, I think I've got a few years left of work to do. Thank you.